Man, it is so, so good to be with you. We just want to welcome in everybody who is watching online. Uh, before I really go any further, um, I, have to give, I have to give some moments of appreciation um, to the tons and tons and tons of people who have literally been um, rehearsing, practicing, spending a tons of extra time here to create this space for all of us to, um, to, to circle around Jesus. And, uh, and so would you put your hands together in appreciation for all of those people? So, so awesome. If... Uh, if you're brand new and this is your first time, uh, my name's Josh, and I'm one of the guys on the team here, and we started this church for people who um, haven't necessarily given up hope or faith in God, uh, but have kind of been burned or said, like, man, I don't really like the church, I don't like being a part of um, all this stuff that has happened in my family's life or my life, or something was said to me at some phase in my journey, or I had a question and nobody could answer it, and so I was just like, I'm, you know, I'm tired, I want to leave the elementary thing behind, and so I'm just going to hide out and camp out, and, and so maybe... Maybe you've been burned out and, and it's maybe you are here because somebody else kicked you out of somewhere else, all right? Um, we are so, so glad that you are here. Uh, movement is a, is a community of people where you can believe, you, like you can literally belong here before you believe everything that we believe. And so uh, move at your own pace, but we say move. Right. Uh, so what's, what's, what's really special and important for us as a community um, is Jesus is our leader and scripture is our guide. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to kick off tonight and read from Matthew chapter 2. Um, we're going to start in verse 1 here in a minute. And, uh, and so if you want to grab your Bibles or version Bible apps on your phones or smart devices or whatever, you can, you can read with us. I'll be reading from the NIV. Um, the, before we get going, though, I got to tell you, I've never really liked darkness. Have you? I mean, like, have you ever really liked darkness? Like I remember as a kid, like there was a period in time in my life where um, confession, this is going to make me look really soft, all right? I promise I'm not, all right? So I had to have a nightlight as a kid because I was just so afraid of the darkness because I couldn't see what was in the room. I couldn't see who was in the room. And, uh, and, and I think like many of us would probably say like, I don't really necessarily like the darkness. Uh, whenever we moved to New England uh, two and a half years ago, uh, we made some new friends and they gave us like a welcome bag. And it's hilarious. In this welcome bag, like you would think there would be things like star crunches and like Reese's peanut butter cups, the double size, the thick ones, or you know, the white ones, or, or like a, a, a a Reese's, like, some sort of awesome thing, but not in this welcome basket. And this welcome basket was a bottle of vitamin D pills. <laughs> and so, you know, pretty much the common denominator was like, uh, we don't know if you know exactly how dark New England is, like, figuratively uh, and literally. Like, like, it's like so dark here that like eight months out of the year, it's like we're, we're on visit, we're on like, you know, visitation rights with the sun. Like the sun might come out, it might not come out. The sun, you know, most of you wake up before the sun comes out. Um, you are uh, working and you get home and it is still dark and so you feel like it is dark all the time. Trust me, I've never really liked the dark at all. A couple years ago, I was at a Christmas present, a Christmas party, and uh, we were doing like a, a, a New England swap. Like everybody brings something from around their house that they don't want anymore, and uh, and then you trade it, and then you're supposed to act surprised, and you're supposed to say that you love it, and and be kind, and not steal gifts from other people. And so I opened up my gift, and I it was a light bulb, and I was like. Not any kind of light bulb, okay? Like, like I, I thought if, if you're going to bring a light bulb to a party, um, it's got to be like a high efficiency, like a Philips LED that lasts for like 100 gazillion hours, but not this light bulb. Like literally somebody t had to have taken it from their grandma's house, uh, like pulled it out because the, the light bulb was really, really old. And uh, I, I like I get home and I'm super bummed out. I'm like, well, uh, I do have one light I need to change. And so I walked into the room, I pulled the globe off and I put the light on and I flipped the switch and nothing. <laughs> Can you believe that? Nothing, nothing. And some of us, that's kind of what life is like. Like life was like we were given, we were delivered this promise, like we thought this is what it was gonna be like and we flipped the switch and nothing. And it's like just disappointment after discouragement, after despair, and it's just like on a cycle of repeat. And if you're anything like me, you just, yeah, I, I don't like the darkness, like not even a little bit. As a kid, I remember I retraced my steps all the way back and as a kid, it, it, it basically started um, with, when I was a little kid, it started with the nightlight and then it moved to when I, when I would wake up and have to go to the bathroom. You've had this moment, haven't you? Where you're like, I gotta go, but it's really, really dark. 
It's really dark, and so I'm going to run as fast as I possibly can. And I'm, I'm, a creative, I'm a creative, so I try to solve problems creatively. And so I thought about using the window, and my mom found out. And so like, now I know, now I know as a kid, as a kid, I had to go down the hallway, which felt like four miles long whenever you're five years old, right? And so we moved into a new place this summer, and um, our kids were like, our kids were terrified of being there in the dark, which I could understand. It's a 200-year-old farmhouse, and the guy we bought it from um, told us some creepy stuff right before he left town. Thanks so much. <laughs> and, uh, and so our boys are like, I don't like being here in the dark. I was like, okay, so... Um, Here's the, like, so, so, like, one afternoon, we go around, and we, like, show them where every single switch is. Like, okay, now you guys know where all the switches are. So one night, not too long after we were there, it was summer, the sun was up in the sky for a really long time, and it was, it had gotten dark, and my youngest son, Jeremiah, is like, Daddy, can you go to the bathroom with me? And I was like, dude. We have graduated the wiping. You know what I mean? Like, I, he's, he's like eight years old, doesn't need my help anymore. And so, like, you're on your own, dude. You don't, it's like, no, dad, I don't like the dock. I don't like the dock. And I was like, Jeremiah, I don't like the dock either. But here's the deal. Dude, listen, look at me. You know where the switches are. Like, you know where the switch is. You know, where, you know where every single switch is from like here to the bathroom? We're talking, this is like 30 feet away from where we pre presently were. And, and, and I was like, I don't like the doc. And his little lips, you know, came out and like, oh, I'm a horrible human. I'm trying to help him grow up and be a man and be, you know, be, be tough and strong. And like, he was like, you know where the switches are? And he just like looked away from me. And he looked at our, our puppy, who's about a year old. And he said, Josie. Josie got off the couch and she said, Joe, come with me. I'm scared of the doc. And he just like looked at me and Josie went with him and it didn't care. He, like he didn't care who went with him. He just didn't want to be alone in the darkness at all. And so that day he creatively solved his own problem. One day he's going to tell people about it in front, you know, on, on Christmas Eve, maybe one day. And so, but every single one of us, every single one of us, like we all have our own personal version of what darkness really is. And if I, like, if, if, if I were to be honest with you and you were to be honest with me, we would come, uh, it doesn't matter what you believe and what your faith background is and what you do or don't think about Jesus, we would say that we don't really like hanging out in the darkness alone. That, like, when we are even in the darkness or somebody else walks into our own darkness, it isn't as dark as it used to be. An entire hotel chain in the 90s put a whole marketing uh, campaign together and they said, we will leave the Light on for you, because there's nothing creepier than paying to sleep in a space that somebody else just slept in and they could be hiding under the sheets or something, you know, like there's no way. And so they know, we know, we, we've all struggled, like nobody likes the darkness. Nobody's really like, I just want to, I just want to sit around, I just want to live in the darkness. Well, here's the good news. You weren't made to live in the darkness. You weren't, you weren't made to have to fight this, this living in the shadows of shame and guilt. And it might be a little bit dark right now in your life. It might be a little dark in your friend's life, your family's life, your coworker's life, in your spouse's life, whatever, whoever, you know somebody that it is kind of dark. And I'm here to tell you that God is big enough to be in their darkness and help you live in the light. That God is so big he, he, is, he can help you through both. He can help you celebrate the light, the light moments in your life where every, everybody is just so full of joy and he's big enough to follow you into the darkness whenever stuff happens in your life and you would never voluntarily sign up for. And it's kind of like the moment where you're walking down a long hallway and you're like, where's the switch? You see, like, light was God's idea. And the first time I ever heard this, I was 18 years old, and I never heard it before. And the preacher stood up in front of everybody, and it was a Christmas Eve service, and he said, wouldn't it just be so cool if we could just speak out loud and create light? You know, and here we are in 2018, Alexa, turn on the lights, right? And so here we are. This is God. This is in the garden. We would say that this is like, this is phenomenal. And don't let it, lo don't let it lose its like mysterious wonder that it creates. God said in Genesis 1 verse 3, he said, let there be light. And there it was. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. 
Later on, a psalmist would commentate on exactly what it looks like, the contrast between light and darkness. He said, is there really any place that I can go to avoid your spirit, be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I fly on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you are there. You'd find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Then I said to myself, oh, he even sees me in the dark. At night, I'm immersed in the light. It is a fact. Darkness isn't even dark to you. Night and day, darkness and light, they're just all the same. A prophet who foretold Jesus' coming named Isaiah, he said about Jesus, talking about Jesus himself, I will lead the blind along an unfamiliar way. I'll guide them down paths that they've never traveled. I will turn the darkness in front of them into light and level out the rough ground. This is what I will do for them. I will not abandon them. See, the big idea for today is love turns the light on. Like Isaiah before Jesus even showed up, he said like, there is going to be this Messiah. He is going to be the savior of the entire world. He's going to take the darkness right in front of us and and turn it with the snap of a finger into light. Just how God spoke and created light from nothing, Jesus can speak into the darkness and change our lives and bring us a kind of light and a joy and a hope and a peace that we had never experienced outside of a relationship with him. Uh, Most recently, uh, somebody passed along an article to me from the Boston Globe um, where it was written in the op-ed and it was a a fantastic piece, Uh, but the writer was basically saying that uh, these two final months of the year are literally like the darkest months in, uh, in humanity in the Western world. Because of all of the triggers, because of all of the pain and all of the suffering uh, that is in your family, that is in my family, and we can't help a little bit as we come through this time of the year to just say, I don't really like feeling like I'm stuck in the dark. And many of us, many of us need to be reminded that love just turns the light on. C.S. Lewis, who is an atheist and skeptic who turned into a Jesus follower and ended up being a professor at one of the most prestigious secular schools in the world, he goes on to say this. He said, if you look for Jesus, you will find him. If you look for Jesus, you will find him and you will find everything else. Many of us have been stumbling around and we've been searching in the dark for something that can only be seen and taken hold of in the light. And that light is Jesus. For, for most of us, we think of like, you know, what, what do we do? Do we like plan our path and, and live our lives and create a, a course of our lives that we just avoid darkness altogether? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, the, the chief priests and the religious leaders of the day um, actually had this ethic of avoidance. But Jesus had an ethic of complete engagement. You see, every one of us have this version of ourselves that we don't share with everyone. We kind of keep that part of us in the darkness. And we only let one or two or maybe three people in to see the real version of ourselves. And the version of ourselves that we actually bring into the light is not real. It is an actual, like, it, it, is, it is like nothing but theater. And for most of us, we take the theater version of ourselves and we go out into the world and we desire this deep, long connection and we wonder why we are still feel like we're sitting in the dark. And it's because, it's because we haven't turned the switch on. Whenever we suffer, God empowers us to face the worst and become our best with his help. C.S. Lewis said, without Jesus, it is always winter and never Christmas. And every, you know, for, for those of us who live in a part of the world that is like uh, freezing cold for the majority of the year, um, we could say that like Jesus is the hope and brings the purpose um, to miserable, miserable, miserable winter. Uh, for, for many of us, we have, we have endured a lot of darkness, and for, for those of you who grew up in New England, this is, per, like, this is part of who you are, and this is a part of our story. In 1952, a T2 oil tanker called the Pendleton split in half off of the coast of Cape Cod. The year before, the Pendleton had actually had a three-way fracture in its steel, and despite a failure to repair this, this mishap, the boat still passed inspection in January in 1952. The call came into the Coast Guard in Cape Cod, and nobody saw exactly what was going to happen or what was coming. But the Pendleton had split in half, and the the historic raging nor'easter made it brutally difficult for rescue. 
All of a sudden, the Coast Guard made a plan, and they didn't think that they were going to make it. They didn't think they were going to be able to get past the bar, which had earned the nickname across all of the world, the Graveyard of the Atlantic. As they passed the bar, they faced 60 to 70 foot waves capsizing, and those waves busted their windshield. It, it caused them to lose their compass and their ability to communicate back with base. Nothing but thick fog in front of them. They thought all hope was lost, and they just kept pushing forward. All of a sudden, one of the Coast Guards stands up, and he sees, he sees a good, like what he said to be a ghost ship straight in front of him. And he looked up, and he was like, they're, no, they're all gone. There's no way. We're too late. We're too late. And all of a sudden, a man jumped up to the top and started waving his arms and screaming. Shortly after that, another man, and then another dozen men, and another dozen. And in total, there were 33 men that were still alive on this boat. Amazing, incredible, yes. But what these Coast Guard men began to realize before they were drawing near to the Pendleton was that there were more men that were still alive and safe on the Pendleton that they actually had room for in their rescue boat. The youngest Coast Guard, who had just, like, just began practicing, uh, speaks up. He says, sir, permission to speak freely. And he says, I, like, I, I, I feel like either we all come home or we all die out here trying to bring everyone home. We're not going back unless we're going back with every single one of them. And that is exactly what they did. They dogpiled on top of one another. They stacked themselves on top of one another. And the only problem was is they had to get back. They had to go back through the bar. They had to go back through the fog with no communication, no radio, no compass, no light switch. And so everybody back at base, they knew that they'd lost communication. They knew the technology. They knew that there was no way to communicate. They knew that with the thick, intense fog in Cape Cod, there was going to be no way for this, for this rescue boat to actually catch hold of the light that would come from the lighthouse. And so somebody made a call. Somebody made a call and said, I need you to call every person you know, and I need you to bring your car. I need you to bring it out here right now to Chatham Station. We're going to line up the beach, and we're going to turn every single one of our headlights, and we're going to bring our boys home. And in the middle of the night, 100 people drove to the edge of that beach. Why? Because love turns the light on. In, in this most intense moment, I, I want to I ask you um, to add a new Christmas movie to your list. This story has been immortalized in, uh, in, in film and is called The, the Finest Hours. And um, one of my most favorite scenes in, in film of all time is all of these men reaching the beach and everybody thought all hope was lost. And seeing that moment of all of these hundred people, some of them family, some of them friends, but most of them were complete strangers. Most of them just answered a call. Most of them just took up their friend's word and said, yeah, we'll come. We'll just shine a light. That's all we're going to do. We'll just show up and we'll just shine a light. That's all we need to do. And I watch, like, as I watch all of these men get onto the, the beaches, they're kissing the ground, and they're embracing all of these people who came and parked and lit the way home for them. In the middle of 2016, while life was probably pretty normal for you, God flipped a switch in our heart and our story and in our lives, and we came to New England for the first time. And we began praying this prayer and setting our alarm every day at 6.03, and when our alarm goes off, it would be a switch in our hearts. And we began to pray this prayer. God, move me closer to somebody who needs to move closer to you. And many of your friends and family have been praying that prayer. And as a result, that's why some of you are here right now. And that's why some of you who are watching online right now are watching online. Because your friends and family care enough about you just to flip a switch and shine a light in your life. Because love turns on the light. Well, it always happens to me in the most, like, awkward, I would never sign up for it kind of ways, and I usually never see it coming, you know? I, like, I never, I, I, like, never see it coming. And so, I, like, I was kind of missing home, and it was kind of a dark, it was kind of a dark day, I had some stuff happen, had some, had some friends going through hard stuff, and it was a hard, it was just a hard day. And one of my friends, one of my friends, Bob, he was like, hey, if you're ever missing home, you just need to go to Walmart. 
And I was like, well, because it just like, it feels just like home. And so like we, we go to Walmart in the worst time in the world to go to Walmart, which is like Christmas time, okay? I am like, I load up. I had to get a whole bunch of stuff. I promise we shop local almost always, almost all the time. We had to go there to get some stuff. We can't get locally. And so I am in the checkout line. I'd waited for a really long time. And that's pretty dark. That's pretty darkness, you know? And so I get up to this sweet lady named Helen. She's been working there for 20 years. Every time that she is working, we try our best to, to get in front of her line. Been building this relationship with her. And I, like, as I'm getting there and unloading my stuff, I'm like loading everything onto the conveyor belt. The basket is empty. And all of a sudden, my alarm goes off. And it's 6.03. And I'm like, really? Like right now, my alarm's going off. And so I'm like, okay, God, I need you to just move, move me closer. Somebody needs to move closer to you. And, um, but I don't say it out loud because that'd be like super, super creepy. And so I looked up and out of the corner of my eye, I see this man walking past me wearing an OU hat, University of Oklahoma hat, which for me is a huge deal because that's like home. And I was like, hey, man. And he like turned around and he looked at me, which is like, I know it's not normal for New Englanders to do that. <laughs> and I was like, you're from where I'm from. And he was like, well, where are you from? And I said, Oklahoma. And he goes, I'm not from Oklahoma. <laughs> and I was like, but you're wearing the OU hat. And he's like, yeah, I'm from Dallas. I'm, I'm the Sooner fan. And I, like, I love the Sooners. And I was like, oh, that's really awesome, which turned into this long conversation. And, uh, and <laughs> he was like, so why did you move to New England? And I said, well, funny you ask. This is a conversation killer. I actually moved here with some of my friends. <laughs> Uh, to start a church for people who don't like church, but maybe they haven't yet given up on Jesus. And he just kind of looked at me. I was like, huh, that's kind of cool. Where are you at? And I tell him, you know, 27 Depot Street. And, and so, like, I had this conversation. It was, it was awesome. Um, and I turned back around to sweet Helen, who was so patient with me. And I turned right back around, and she looked at me, and she was like, so you're from Oklahoma? And I said, yes. And she said, what did you move here for? And I looked to my right, and the line was like 14 people deep. And I was like, here's my shot. I'm going to talk a little bit louder so that everybody else can hear me, because this might be, like, people in this line, these 14 people in this line, this may be your friends. This may be your family who are walking through the darkness right now. This may be your son. This may be your daughter. This may be somebody that you care about deeply, and they're living in some kind of darkness. And I don't want to miss it. And so I just sat there and I talked a little bit louder and Helen just kind of smiled the whole way through. And um, if you're one of those 14 people in line that day, um, God's crazy about you. And so are we. And I know that your life, I don't know what it took for you to be here today. I don't know what kind of a darkness you've had to walk through to find your way to 27 Depot Street. I don't know what kind of a suffering you've had to endure. I don't know what kind of a silence you've had to keep and hide, like who you really are. But what I do know is that there are two real moves that we can all make. Number one, we can allow, like, like I'm not even, I can't even force you, pressure you, push you, persuade you. I can't do anything to push you out of your own darkness. But what I can do is I can ask you, I can create an opportunity, and I can ask you to allow God to meet you there. Like, for those of us who I've already said yes, I've already allowed God to meet me there. I've already began a relationship. I've, I've, he's like shown up in my darkness over and over and over and over again. The second move that we can make is to willingly look at the darkness in our friends' lives and ask God to give us the courage to go and drop anchor with them. To have this kind of love for people that says, like, I, like, I don't know, what, what would it be like if we could be a kind of people who say, um, never I will leave you and never I will forsake you. I will be a forever friend. And with the light of Jesus, that is actually possible for all people from all walks of life, all backgrounds, all socioeconomic all kinds of education paths and vocations, every season of life. Love turns on the light.